Happy Easter. Love this season. It's such a great time of year because here we are able to just rejoice in the fact that Jesus is risen. I pay them to do that. He is truly risen. This is a joy for us. This is something for you and for me as Christians. This is it. This is the difference maker. This is what sets us on fire. This is what we celebrate and should be at the very peak of everything that we ever think or do. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I spoke last week about the fire and we literally did start a fire here in this church. We physically had a fire burning right in the middle over here from which we lit our candles and in the darkened church from one candle to another, passing it around till everybody in the church had a lit candle, spreading the fire and the light of Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful image it is. If you've never experienced it, it really is a beautiful scene to, to witness because that's the fire of Jesus that is spreading. But as I pointed out last week, we have a lot of imagery that sometimes goes counter to the way Jesus wants us to, to kind of approach things. Take, for instance, like I use the song, We Didn't Start the Fire from Billy Joel. He uses the fire as the evil things that were happening, the bad things were happening. He takes decades of the 20th century and kind of spells them out as this fire that's always been burning. And it's just the, you know, these bad things that are just going to keep happening and keep happening. And even though we try to stop it, I don't want to stop the fire because it isn't the bad things. It's the light of Christ spreading forth. It's Jesus Christ. Now, he, here's, here's the key. Recall from Luke's gospel. Jesus himself came out and said, I have come to light a fire on the earth. Remember that? I've I wish it were burning right now, he says. It's burning, my dear brothers and sisters. He came to light that fire and that the good news would spread to all places. But here's the, here's the connection. Here's the connection. He says things like that. Then you have today's gospel. And what did he do in today's gospel? He breathed on his disciples, on the apostles, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a real difference maker. We're still in that period of just after the resurrection. The apostles are having their encounters. But remember that this culminates on Pentecost. And our first reading actually is post-Pentecost. And what happened on Pentecost? They were gathered in that same upper room and tongues of fire. Tongues of fire settled on all of them. And they were all enlightened in that moment. And all of a sudden, they went from these cowering... Like, I mean, today they were cowering in fear in that room with the doors locked. They were so frightened they had the doors locked. And then one couple of weeks later, those tongues of fire come upon them and they go out boldly and take that light with them and spread the word that Jesus is risen. Boy, you guys are slipping. Last mass, they were a little better than this, I'll tell you. He is truly risen. That's our proclamation. That's the difference. That's the moment that everything changed. And now down through history, we can point, and let's face it, we can point to a lot of things that have gone wrong. And the 20th century might have been one of the most egregious. See, leading up to the 20th century, there was a thing kind of going on in the background. It was a growth in what they called skepticism. And it's still there. It's not gone. It actually started with people like, you know, Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes being the epitome of what skepticism looks like. In his proof of the existence of God, he tries to prove that everything is a lie. And by trying to doubt everything and to say that nothing is real, he comes to one conclusion. And we all know this. I think, therefore I am, therefore it isn't an absolute lie. Of course, he goes on for another five chapters proving the existence of God in it. But his skepticism, his doubt, his methodology started to become more and more of what they used, especially in the scientific method. Doubt everything that came before. Forget everything that someone has told you. Go out and experience it for yourself. Now we get to the 20th century, because all that science gave us, it, it unleashed power. I mean, when you think about it, it gave us such a different world. To the point where in the 20th century, some horrific things happened. And you can't, you can't deny it. Some horrific things happened. We had two world wars, one worse than the other. Millions and millions of lives being snuffed out. Two very horrific wars. We also had the Korean War, the Vietnam War, but so many other things too. We had the Great Depression. 
We had so many things going on. And now people are already coming and approaching things with doubt, with skepticism. They're already coming up and saying, oh, you know, hold on a second. Maybe this God doesn't exist. Maybe this Jesus Christ didn't really rise from the dead. Maybe all of this is just one big lie. And we're all prone to that kind of skepticism. We were steeped in it. It surrounds us wherever we go. If you think about it, most people, if I can't see and I can't touch, they have their St. Thomas moment. How many of you had that St. Thomas moment where you started to doubt and then Jesus does show up to take away your doubt? Because I haven't had it yet. I, I've been kind of hoping I could probe the nail marks, but he hasn't done it for me. But I still believe. I still believe that he rose from the dead. I still believe that he empowered us with the Holy Spirit. That skepticism influences us and it's up to us to find a way to overcome that, to find a way to Jesus Christ, to find a way to believe. Because God needs us so much right now. People doubted in the 20th century. I mean, they said, where was God? You know how quickly we forget? How poor and slow we are to believe? Think of the 20th century. You could think of all the horrible things that happened. You could go listen to the Billy Joel song and, and he can list them for you. Or you can stop for a moment and say, hold on a second. In 1917, Our Lady appeared to three children in Fatima. She did. And these three innocent children, I mean, they were under 10 years old. These three innocent children go home and tell their parents, and their parents didn't believe them. And then they got persecuted for it to the point of being arrested by the local government and being threatened to be boiled in oil if they don't recount their story. Children. They were mocked. They were ridiculed for believing. And all of these secular forces, all of these atheist forces were around them trying to silence them. And they thought they had their chance because the kids said, come back in October. There's going to be a great miracle Our Lady's going to give us. Come back in October and don't worry about it. She's going to perform this miracle for everybody to see. And so they said, ah, we've got our chance. Nothing's going to happen. And these kids are going to look like little fools. 70,000 people showed up. 70,000 people witnessed the sun begin to spin in the sky and come crashing down towards Earth and then go back to its place. You think the eclipse tomorrow is going to be a big deal? 70,000 people saw this miracle. And of those 70,000, there were atheists and there were all these secular people who all converted. I mean, let's face it, if you were standing out in the field and the sun came hurtling at your face, I think that would wake you up. The flame was ignited. And even around that time of World War I, God was still saying, no, come back to me. Give your lives to me. Take the flame of the Holy Spirit into this world that is so dark. And through three innocent little children, a revolution began. Then we started to forget again. And, you know, it's funny. Right before World War II, people talk about World War II. Right before World War II, Sister Faustina was having mystical encounters with Jesus Christ and the Blessed Mother. Now, not many people knew about it because she kept it quiet. Her spiritual director said, just put it all in your diary. Just write it all down. Just keep writing it and keep writing it. Well, that diary was eventually translated into Italian and sent to Rome, and it was mocked. She died. Nobody knew while she was alive, except for a handful of people, that she was having these mystical encounters. She died. The, the uh, diary was sent to Rome, and they said, this is, this is gibberish. And that's because not many people in Rome spoke Polish. It was a big problem. Think about it. This one innocent woman who died a very terrible death at 33 years old, no irony there, is there, gave us the divine mercy. In her simple little way of just saying, God's mercy is unfathomable. God's mercy, mercy is available. You can receive God's mercy. Turn away from these horrible things. Turn away from sin and come back to the mercy of God. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your sins are poured, the blood poured out for your sins forgiven is available. God's mercy. One simple little woman started a whole revolution called the Divine Mercy Devotion. If you haven't read St. Faustina's diary, I highly recommend it. There's some beautiful things to meditate on it. And if you're not good at like, you know, being picking the book up regularly, there's actually a podcast. You can do the diary in a year with Father Joe Roche. Start it today, and by this time next year, you'll have gotten through the entire diary. 
In it is where we get the Chaplet of the Divine Mercy, where we get some of the prayers that we're going to offer this afternoon. In it is such powerful imagery for you and for me. So when someone ever says to you, the 20th century was horrible, it was terrible, that's our fault. Because God didn't quit. How many, how, you know how much spiritual activity there was last century? Nobody really knows about it. Our Lady, we know about Fatima, we know about you know, St. Faustina. How many of you know that Our Lady appeared in Egypt? in Zaitun, Egypt. I've been there. She appeared in Russia, in the Ukraine. She appeared in Japan. I could go on. There's, there's dozens of locations where she appeared. Kibeho. God has been trying and trying and trying to get our attention and say, no, 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 you're, you're, you're paying attention to the wrong thing. Don't pay attention to the evil. Pay attention to his mercy, to his love, to his gift of his son. Pay attention to that. Find a way to Jesus Christ. You know, you see it in the disciples today. They go from that cowering community to that bold community. And in that early community, they get rid of all their differences. You heard it in the first reading. They did everything they could to try to live that life of unity. Isn't that what, we, what the Holy Spirit's supposed to be about? And yet how many of us spend all of our time dividing still? And I'm not even going to talk about politics. Forget about that. I'm talking about right in the church. How divided we can be sometimes even here. We need to come together with that common ground of Jesus Christ. The one who rose from the dead. The one who changed everything in history. The one who promises us true peace. And the one who says, find a way. Go out and do it. Share the mercy you've received with others. Share the light that you've received with others. Today, the power of the Holy Spirit overshadows you all. The tongues of flame are coming upon each one of you. Jesus said, I give you the Holy Spirit. Go forth, he said. Share the good news, he said. So go share the good news. Don't be like such sourpusses when you go out of here. Don't be like, you know, oh, Jesus Christ, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Go forth, share that good news. Find a way to get that word out there, to get that light out there, to get this world that's in darkness to have that great light, that fire that was lit by Jesus Christ. The fire that is still burning. Don't fight it. Share it. Don't try to squelch it. Promote it. God hasn't quit. He won't quit. He won't give up on you. He won't give up on me. He won't give up on anybody. So be God's emissary of mercy to the ends of the world. I commission you today, my dear brothers and sisters. Next week, we're going to hear a little bit about the road to Emmaus and the journey that we're all on. We're journeying together, walking together. And when we bring our light together, it shines all the brighter. Go forth and be light in this world of darkness. Go forth and share the good news. Jesus is risen. Eh, a little better. God bless you.